Okay, so for the benefit of everybody in the room and on the call, I just want you to know that they are recording this presentation starting now. So just be careful what you say because they might be hearing you. Okay, welcome everybody. We're so glad that you're here. Um, we're kind of excited about this because I know there was a German genealogy group in the past and we're really glad that we can hopefully get it revived a little bit here. There's no other German genealogy group in the North Texas area, so we wanted to try to establish one. Um, several of us, a uh, couple of us, met at the International German Genealogy Partnership in uh, California this year. They had a conference in Sacramento, and we started talking and decided that, you know, we really need to do something in North Texas. And um, the other German societies in Texas are a little bit farther south, and it's a bit of a drive. So we wanted something a little bit closer to home in North Texas. We also want everybody to, to help us make this a success as well. So I'm gonna to go to the next slide, I think. There we go. So we have an agenda here and we'll explain kind of why we have this agenda in a few minutes. We have um, some beginner things and some a little bit more advanced topics to talk about today. I'd like to first introduce um, Tony, who is running our Zoom session, and so he's got all these microphones crazily set up, so if you stop hearing us, uh, say something on the chat. I'm gonna let uh, Kathleen talk about that. Kathleen? Okay, so my name is Kathleen Murray, I'm running the chat. I'm also a participant in the uh, phone itself, so if you don't have it through remote, what you wanna do is open up, it looks like most of you kind of open up your chat, have it visible. And I'm going to be monitoring this for our questions. So we're going to take questions at the end of uh, Derman's uh, talk and at the end of uh, Ian's talk. So it, it probably would be helpful to me if we uh, presented your question with the word question so that it was easy for me to find you in the chat feed. And then at the end, I will read out questions so that you can hear them uh, and we'll get answers to them. And if for any reason you have a follow-up question or you want to go to my mic, then uh, you can unmute me in the chat room and uh, in the participants will have what you would say, and you can follow up the question. So uh, as it is, we'll try to handle things on the mic and then hopefully that will work. Uh, and if somebody's telling me that they can't hear me, then I'm up for this. Is that any better for you, Lois? Okay, is this any better? One, two, three. Can you hear me a little bit better? I need to hear from, there we go. Uh, your mic is muted. No, actually, oh, one of you can hear me. Uh, one of them thinks my mic is muted. Okay, Do you want any better here? I'm not gonna talk a lot, so my mic is probably not that important. All right, I think that's all I needed to say, and uh, just to keep the, keep make you feel like you're a part of all this. Uh, and we are picking up you from another mic. Okay, we'll look into that and I'll let them proceed. Sorry about that. Okay, also I wanted to introduce um, Bernard Meisner, who's gonna be our other speaker here today. So he's up front here as well. Okay, we have set a meeting schedule for 2020. We are gonna meet every other month, at least for the first year. And we're going to meet on the second Saturday of the month, except for November, like, like today, where we have to meet on the same day as the Dallas genealogy meeting. And that is because November 2020 is the Texas State genealogy meeting on the second Saturday, which some of us participate in, so we, won't, we wanted to avoid that if possible. So again, we'll be, this is on our website, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but again, it's going to be um, 10.30 to 12 for most of the time on the second Saturday of the month every other month, okay? <clears throat> we have an email, and it's turned green for some reason, but um, our email is ggg at Dallas G 
genealogy.com. So it's pretty easy to remember. It's also um, on the Dallas website. So what we've done is we have a page off of the DallasGenealogy.com, which hopefully you're familiar with. And you can click on events and special interest groups and you'll see the German interest group there. And you'll find our web page. And we also have a Facebook page, which will help you, you will join. There are a lot of German genealogy Facebook pages out there. Ours is German Genealogy Group of North Texas. And there was already a German genealogy group. I think that's somewhere in the Northeast. So we had to make sure that we could clarify that it was of North Texas. And uh, we get a little behind sometimes on, on adding people, so be a little patient there. And as we add you, there are a few questions you have to answer answer to join the Facebook page. Okay. Is there anybody that has any questions on this? Okay. So everybody can see it, okay. All right, um, basically our focus is to work together to help people who have ancestors that um, are from Germany, and I know Germany is a quote Germany because it wasn't always Germany, right? So people of German descent and work together and try to um, help each other out. That's kind of basically our focus. And so we're also going to be focusing on early Germans and later Germans all the way through kind of different variety. To start this group, we needed to do a Facebook uh, survey, actually not Facebook, I'm sorry, uh, we did a survey monkey. survey monkey ship, survey monkey <laughs> survey. And um, so Kathleen and Tony um, had a lot to do with that. And what we wanted to do was find out if there was enough interest in North Texas to form this group. So the Dallas Genealogy Society gave us permission to try and make this group go, okay? Of that, there were several questions that were asked, and one was how interested you were in German genealogy. And so this table addresses just the experience, the very interested and in, extremely interested. And we also wanted to know your experience in German genealogy. And we found that out of this group of people, 41 out of the 64 had little or no experience in German research. So we're going to have some beginner stuff a little bit and, and also try to keep advanced stuff so we can keep the others interested that have a little bit more experience as well. Okay. Now the survey also asked other questions and we found out that some in the group had ancestors from Pennsylvania that came into Pennsylvania. We had some that came into Texas and we had several that went into the Midwest. So those are different areas of research, right? I have a lot of Midwest experience because mine came into Illinois, to the Chicago area, but also traveled around the various Midwestern states. Uh, Bernard also has experience with Pennsylvania and Texas Germans, as well as a little bit of, of Midwest. So we kind of bring that variety, but there's other resources that can help you as well as we go further in our discussions here. Now, what we'd like to do is ask you, is there anybody that have, can tell us what you want to get out of this group? Because we gave you kind of what the survey said, and that's kind of what we know right now, but is there any other interests that anybody has in this group? What, do you, what would you like to get out of this group? Do you want to be able to trace your ancestors into their hometowns, get records in Germany, you know, write to archives? I mean, what, what kinds of things would you like to be able to do? You want to understand the German websites? Um, help me out here. Yep. I would like to make informed travel decisions so I can go and see the homes of my great grandparents. Okay, informed travel decisions to, to see the home of your great grandparents. That's awesome. I'm going to do that next year, actually. Again, yep. How do you organize it all once you get all the Okay. So the best way uh, to organize or to put it on paper is what you're like to get, understand. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Yep. I've got some roadblocks I need help with. Awesome. We've got some roadblocks we need help with. And uh, 
we're going to actually have asked for you to, to uh, either email us with your roadblocks or put it on Facebook. And if you don't do Facebook, email us and uh, we'll actually try to help with the roadblocks. And if we actually might be bringing it to the group to try to help with your roadblock as well. Okay, uh, Kathleen has some. Okay, so from the chat room, I hope you can hear me. We have uh, one person is interested in tracking and historical records and basically anything beyond that, everything. And another one wants to know specifically uh, how to find a hometown and get records. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Yep. Uh, yes, I, I'm just going to interject that in a way, this is, I, I hope this would be a Germanic, wherever the German language was spent. Uh, what it was spoken, uh, but uh, because if, if you get into uh, genealogy in, in Germany, you're going to find all the Hanseatic cities. You're going to find those people that went into the Ukraine and have been recently repatriated. But many of those came back and, and then ended up up in the uh, Dakotas and so forth, very late in their immigration period. And uh, the, the same with uh, uh, East Prussia. Uh, you know, you get out in, in because Germany kept pushing frontiers, and down to Ukraine when Catherine the Great invited people in there to try to populate that area. So that's may, may not be immediate, but I'd like to see us sure. eventually go to some of these things. So I can't repeat that whole thing exactly word for word, but uh, basically what he's saying is uh, they're Germanic. In other words, uh, some of the Germans, Germany wasn't Germany, basically. And so there was other areas around in Europe, like the Ukraine, like what is now Russia, you know, where the Germans were as well. And then they came to the U.S., like in the Dakotas um, and places like that. And even Switzerland. And even Switzerland. Sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> Austria, yeah, okay. Good one more. Ah, good. So one more from the uh, chat room. Uh, someone stated that they would like to learn about 18th century life. Okay. So 1700s. Okay. In the U.S., I'm assuming, or in Germany? I'm assuming Germany, but... Uh, okay. Not sure. Okay. Yep. I, uh, I was hoping that we would have enough people doing the research in these things that we also, in addition to the, the vital statistics, have some people that can speak to what the, the customs and places where they found information on the customs sort of feeding into what uh, Kathleen just said. Because that's really where you learn mm -hmm. what your ancestors were doing. And I found that it's sometimes difficult to find that particularly because it varied so much from region to region in Germany. Um, okay, so to summarize, sorry, <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, customs, you know, what what was it like for your ancestor in your area? What were the customs? The rules for marriage. Were rules for marriage. Right. And rules for yeah, and that's very true because I have Germans from different parts of Germany. Or, sorry, Germany and. <laughs> um, and in some cases, the eldest son inherited the property. In other cases, it was the youngest son. You know, it just it in just varies. It was a daughter. Oh, a daughter. I had daughters that inherited the property. Yep, exactly. So it sometimes it's a little varied a little bit. Good. I have one other one coming from Phyllis Knox. Um, she knows a great deal about my German family who came to the Republic of Texas. But as I don't have the surname they used in Germany, can't find the hometown to other families that came uh, with them, and so she hopes to find them first and then her ancestor. Uh, so that sounds good. good. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. You know, working with people, traveling with them really is helpful. Anybody else want to say anything? Yep. I, I would just add to her point about the customs and so forth. I'm most inter interested in the Pomeran uh, society uh, the, uh, up, up near the Baltic. Right, the Pomeran area. And the People active in this country, in, in that area, uh, have, have gotten into customs of Christmas, mm -hmm. recipes, mm -hmm. and many of these things, which are quite fascinating. Uh, so he was talking about adding on to her customs, where uh, he's from the Pomerania area, where they've got Christmas uh, and, recipes. Uh, and recipes and different things from their culture, definitely. Um, do you have any, yep, got one over there. 
I was uh, hoping to get uh, this uh, ways of accessing uh, original or primary vital st uh, records in Germany, mm -hmm. such as birth and marriage and death and residency. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be able to learn to do that. Okay, he wants to learn to be able to get the vital records in Germany. Yeah, yeah I have baptism records. Baptism records. There are several websites for church records that are online, which are going to be very helpful. I'll have to mention those in the future. Okay, okay definitely. Um, did you want another one or no? Anybody else? Okay, and I believe that's it for the introduction. So we're going to let Bernard uh, go next here. Well, thank you, Ann. Uh, I'm Bernard Meissner, the legitimate son of the late Head Records production clerk, Bernard Andrew Meissner, a, uh, who owed allegiance to the mayor of Homestead, Pennsylvania. As you do German research, you're going to find that's how people are placed and how you know who they are with some of the customs we were talking about. And this will answer your one question already right away. What is what do we mean when you say German? Well, it's sort of anybody who wants to call themselves German is German. And this group will, will deal with that as it may be. Uh, as I got up there on the slide, and again, for the people out there in the cloud, we have about 25 people here in the room as well, as you folks out there. I appreciate Tony and Kathleen keeping us connected to you folks as well. Uh, as you see on the slide here, the standard answer to most genealogical questions is, it depends. Well, with so -and -so, so -and so it depends. So it, you always have to pay attention to the time and place uh, where you're talking. So who are the Germans? Where did they live? Uh, in August, Ancestry.com just revealed their latest ethnic groupings. And for the first time, if you look close there in Europe, they now have a German group, a German ethnicity, whatever the heck that might mean. And I have six documented great-great-grandparents all born in Germany. So according to Ancestry, I am 2% ethnic German. <laughs> but again, you have to remember, Germany was in the middle of Europe. You've got France to the west, you've got the Russians and Austro-Hungarians to the east, and there's wars going on all the time. The armies are marching back and forth over Central Europe and leaving their DNA as they go forth and back. So you really have to take with a grain of salt, you know, uh, living DNA, another one has got a big effort to try to get more German people. Germans are very private people, and a lot of them don't even want to get their DNA tested, and they're concerned about, well, what is your ethnicity based on history of about 80-some years ago? So the one thing that I often see on discussion groups is people try to apply 21st century American norms and customs to their ancestors who lived in Germany in the 17, 18, 1900s. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way now. If you're in Germany, you can't wash your car in your driveway. Because what happens to that water, that dirty water, where does it go? You can't mow your lawn on Sunday. That's a quiet day. So you have to keep that in mind as you're doing your research into your German ancestors, that really you have to think, and as we were talking and there's interest, what are the customs, the rules, and the like? If we look at the United States, it sort of expanded westward kind of linearly. Uh, of course, the Native Americans have been here for many thousands of years. But then as the Europeans start to move from the colonies, into the Midwest, the Louisiana Purchase, and the like. They gradually were spreading westward. The lands were territories that then became states. Little villages grew into towns. You know, when was Dallas formed? You know, 200 years ago, there wasn't much of a Dallas at all. And now it's a huge city, and we have millions and millions of people here. And the large counties then had to get divided into smaller counties. Well, things are different in Germany because people, uh, the quote, Europeans have been in Europe a long, long time while we had the Native Americans over here. 
Uh, they had feudal kingdoms, principalities, bishoprics, combining, separating, being recombined, all the wars I mentioned, plagues, uh, the crop failures, the country or empire, if you want to call it German, the Holy Roman Empire, the First Reich, the Second Reich, however many Reichs you want to count, that's expanded and contracted over time. And as you've heard before, you know, there was Catherine the Great invited Germans to come settle in Russia. So a number went over there. And then later on, they decided to throw them back out. But there was still some there, and your ancestors may have been there and then moved to the United States, perhaps from there. Uh, Krista Cowan of Ancestry.com, always emphasizing we should be researchers, not searchers. That you really want to spend as much time trying to understand the records as you do looking in the records for the names of who you hope are your ancestors. You know, who made the records? Why did they make the records? Who is writing it? Who is speaking it? Who indexed it, trying to read the handwriting of the person who wrote it, who wrote what he thought he heard the person speaking say? So you really have to learn to spend the time learning about the records to see are there gaps, what was covered, what might not be covered, and the like. Uh, if we look at the history of Germany in four slides, quick truth through here. Uh, Germania goes back to the Romans and the Caesars had it was sort of the land they couldn't conquer were those darn Germans. They sort of beat up on the Franks and got okay west of the Rhine, east of the Rhine they had problems. There was a Holy Roman Empire established about 962, and that was the period where we started to get into the feudal rules and customs, which we don't really have a history of that in the United States. The idea that God placed you at a certain status in society, and that's where he wants you, and that's where you stay. So if I'm the legitimate son of the records clerk, I probably should look at the profession of a records clerk and shouldn't consider trying to become a tailor or a goldsmith or whatever. Uh, the social standing, you always see that in German records, we'll talk about, we'll see the Stand, S-D-A-N-D. That's more than occupation. No, that's who you are. There are restrictions on movement and marriage, as we talked about. There's lots and lots of illegitimate births at a time, and it's just because they wouldn't allow the people, the couple, to get married. And they had all these rules and regulations they had to jump through. Uh, the concept of compulsive military service, because after you got the fall harvest in, the next thing you did is went and attacked your neighbor. So you had to get all your serfs and minions to form an army and go attack them, and they would do the vice versa. Then we have, of course, in Protestant Reformation, that sort of, to some extent, united a German language. We sort of inherited what Martin Luther's dialect was. Uh, prior to that, the people in South Germany couldn't understand the people in North Germany. Of course, the North, North Germans still can't understand my crazy <laughs> Bavarian ancestors running around in the later Hosen and that sort of stuff. Uh, but this gets into then keeping track of who's us and who's them? And the religions then started to keep records, and these are some of the earliest records we'll find, of baptisms, marriage, and burials. And you can see the various churches all sort of did it. So certainly you can find those records back into sometimes the 1500s, 1600s, uh, assuming they survived. And in many cases, they probably did. So this is the Holy Roman Empire in 1648 and it's sort of a relatively large area and actually extends down into Italy. It was the Holy Roman Empire and the Pope played a big role in who was the emperor. Now, if you're going to be looking at sort of the central part there, then you have to be sort of paying attention to whose land was it? To whom did your ancestor owe allegiance? And this is where that it depends really pops up. Now there is a solution, as I mentioned, you can email the German state if once you found the village. And we'll talk a little bit later about how you look to find the village. And you can just ask. Okay, back then, before Napoleon came in, Napoleon said, you got too many different little pieces, we got to put them all together. So he, all the land the bishops had threw that all out, gave it to other folks and the like, and combined things. But you can see early on when you're going to get back trying to some of the, the land records, you're really going to have to pay attention to who did they owe allegiance to 
and you may have three people living side by side in houses in the village. Each one owns allegiance to a different margrave or bishop or duchy or whatever it might be. And they weren't contiguous areas either, as you can see. Okay, another thing happened. The Peace of Augsburg was the point where they said, okay, the ruler gets to pick the religion. And at that time, the two recognized religions were Catholic and Lutheran. Some of the other religions sort of broke up, grew up after that. But then it was sort of what the Prince picks at your religion. Now, in some cases, they did allow people, you don't know, like that move. So but that was sort of designed what it was. And in the case when you're doing German research, in most cases, except for your ancestors, of course, they were either German or they were either Catholic or Lutheran. Wasn't there a Reformed Church? Also? There's a Reformed Church of Calvin's that eventually got sort of forced in to being evangelical. evangelical. But, the, but the initial piece of Augsburg, there were only two. There was only one originally, and Martin Luther started things. And then it split up into all the different ones we have now. The Thirty Years' War is sort of significant in terms of records because it was so devastating. And you may find really hard to find records before that time. It's just that so much destruction and death occurred that a lot of records didn't survive. But that's back to 1648, and right now I'm stuck at 1800, so I've got a good ways to go. We have, as I mentioned, Napoleon came in. He sort of consolidated all those little areas into larger, more contiguous areas, and he also started civil registration of births, marriages, and deaths. Uh, when he was defeated, some of the places said, well, the French are gone, we're not going to do that anymore. And others said, no, that's a good idea, we'll keep the records. But that sort of started the records. You may find they're going to be in French and maybe use the French calendar. Remember, they had 10 months, not 12. But the records are there. I've seen examples of those sorts of records. And uh, that's one possibility. Then, again, a little bit more merger of the German Confederation. They're starting to get together. Uh, they add in Bohemia, which to a large extent was not German speaking, although there were parts. And then that was dominated by the Austrians. And then the Prussians sort of started to take over and became the North German Confederation. And again, you can sort of get a feel for that inside the red line boundary was that confederation. So again, we see things are flexing back and forth, expanding and contracting. Then finally in 1871, we sort of get the, the German Empire and Prussia sort of led that. Uh, now we have the civil registrations, birth mess, deaths and marriages from 1875 more or less. And also significant, you had to get married in a civil ceremony. If you want to do a church one afterward, sure, fine, go ahead and do that. But to this day, you have to have a civil marriage. So there will be civil records starting from about the 18, mid 1870s. Also significant for the area, if you're working with the Family History Library uh, on, online as familysearch.org or you go to the library, their card catalog is arranged in terms of the, this German right. There we see in 1871 to World War One, and that was Prussia sort of in blue. Although if your ancestors can, they came from Prussia, there really was an East Prussia and a West Prussia, Prussia. And then there was Pomerania and all these other places which were sort of air quotes Prussia as well. So you may have to sort of figure out and again, trying to look at the town. They said they were Prussia. It doesn't necessarily mean areas we now would consider Poland, which are East Prussia and West Prussia. But you need to pay attention to that. So then after the war, there was the Weimar Republic. Inflation just went through the roof. You know, people had wheelbarrows of money and the like. We hear a little bit of that going on in Venezuela nowadays as well. And then, of course, we have World War II. And then after that, then they started to give lands back. Poland 
it reappeared. It, there was no Poland for a while, and now it was back again. Austria had been incorporated into the Reich, and then it eventually uh, became a country again in 1955. And the Allies sort of made up some of these little areas. If you have Baden, Württemberg, Baden, Württemberg, Hohenzollern, they were all formed into Baden, Württemberg in 1952. So again, you're looking back in time, sort of where are the records, where were they living? Uh, and 1957, they formed yet another state, Sarling, uh, which was, if you had the Palantite folks, that used to be part of Bavaria, and now since 57, it's a separate state. And of course, they have the three city-states as well, sort of like we have Washington, D.C., and they keep their own records there. Finally, we had the German reunification in October of 1990. And nice for us as genealogists, in 2007, they passed the Civil Registration Reform Act, which made records more available to we, the genealogists. So now birth records older than 110 years, marriage older than 80, death records older than 30 are available publicly. Although if you're contacting an archive, they may still be thinking the old rules. So it doesn't hurt if you can specify what is your relationship to the person whose records you are requesting. But in theory, these older records now should be publicly available. And they're also supposedly moving them from the little cities into regional archives as well. And that may or may not be the case. So you probably want to start at the city level, and then they may say, oh yeah, those records are now in an archive, and then you can work from there. So there we have now the Federal Republic of Germany as it stands now. And again, with the emphasis on the city-states, there's Bremen and Bremen Haven. There's a little red up on the coast, the port, and then Bremen, the city. That's sort of, think like Washington, D.C., like I say. Hamburg is like that, and as is Berlin. So they keep their own records. They have their own separate little government. So when we say, what's German, Germanic Germany? Well, it's really not a race. It's not an ethnicity people that have a common history, common language. If you go look for records, one of the things you may find, and we'll talk in later sessions, about these family history books that have been organized. If you have one for your village or your family, it's a great find, but you can see they're not just confined to what we now think of as Germany. Because in fact, before coming to America, you may find those German folks that were all the way up north in the, even Latvia, or Bulgaria, Italy, or even Spain, uh, France. We always have Alsace-Lorraine, you know, on the west side of the Rhine, and whose was that? And it kept changing hands going back and forth. And then Russia in the east, uh, and even down, it's really, they're Austrians that went down into northern Italy. I was on a tour there once, and the northernmost part is called South Tyrol. And the towns there have German names and Italian names. They have dual names. And it's probably the one place I felt I was discriminating because I was speaking German. I was trying to buy some stamps at the tobacco store, and I think they were Italians. I wanted to buy the stamps. I said, no, no, you got to buy the postcard. So I have the postcard. I just want the stamps. No, no, we can't sell you that. So <laughs> fortunately, this town was big enough. It had two tobacco shops. I went to the other one. A uh, couple of references, and we have the handout that's here for the people in the room. It's on the website for the people out there in the cloud. And just a couple books that I found particularly interesting. This one's here in the Dallas Library, as well as a few others that goes in the history of the lands. And then James Beidler has a series of books that he's published. There's the Family Tree German Genealogy Guide. Then more recently, Tracing Your Roots Online, and he also has one with a whole bunch of maps in it as well. So German is, if you want to call yourself German, you're probably German, and don't confine yourself to what you think is Germany if you're looking at your ancestors, your ancestors where they might from, come from, and where the records from, from and where the records so, might be. So we have time for a couple questions. One here, the one here in the room. The uh, confusing situation that was once Germany, 
was that uh, just in Germany or did it happen in France and Italy and Spain? And okay, okay, confusing in terms of what was Germany, do the French undergo the same sort of thing? Well, I guess to an extent when you had Napoleon marching across a lot of Europe for a while, they thought that was all French and they imposed their calendar and their records and their laws. So they had their little um, municipalities and principles. Uh, yes, yeah, from the, the age of the Holy Roman Empire, at least, yeah, they started giving lands, you know, the bishops had them, the bishops had uh, mansions for their mistresses, you know, these were the celibate bishops and the like, that they, the church had a lot of the money and had a lot of the land, and then you had, again, you started with the king, and then the lower level royalty, but then they started having sons, and they started having sons, and I read recently, in the case of Germany, one of the problems was they didn't have enough sons. In a number of cases, they didn't have any sons. So then the daughters couldn't inherit the land, so they had to go back to one of the other brothers, one of the uncles and the like. So, but yeah, I think you'll find in many cases, we see nowadays what was Russia, and now we have all these small little countries. Records are just as bad in other countries as, as in Germany. So the largest state, yeah, you got the same sort of issue with records, although again, don't assume the older records don't exist. Don't assume World War II wiped out a lot of the records. The Thirty Years' War did, but you know, you had people that were archivists back then that were as dedicated as the ones we have now, and the things they went through to preserve things. Uh, my name is Meissner. There's a town in Germany near Dresden called Meissen, well known for its porcelain. You go to Jacksonville, Florida, there's a museum there it has this huge collection of Meissen porcelain that survived the war because one guy hid it in a basement. So they did the same sort of thing with records. So don't assume the records aren't available. Just where do you have to find them? This is a, a comment that may help those who are interested in the area if you have a hint of the area like westphalia or whatever that your ancestors came from on facebook there are many groups that are devoted to those specific geographic areas in what is now germany and had been germany and they have participants from germany as well as the u.s and they help with translation with translation and they will help with I'm trying to figure out where I came from, here's what I know, and that kind of thing. Yes, the, just to repeat that in summary, is make use of the web to a large extent. We have our Facebook group, which we hope you'll use all the time between the meetings. And uh, what you basically was saying is for all the different areas of Germanic people, I won't even say Germany, there's usually a Facebook group uh, my Meisters came from Bavaria. There's a Bavarian Facebook group. Uh, they can answer questions. They can help with translations. I've actually located an archivist or a researcher who's going to go to one of the archives on Tuesday and get some more records from my Meissner family from the tiny little village of Pusselsheim, now population 175. Okay. One other I question. I was wondering, were there any other non-Germanic groups or non-European groups in Germany, such as from Turkey in that time period? Uh, okay, oh, my in, it depends, answer, standard, it depends, point of question. Oh, the question is, they had the case of these German enclaves, if you want to call them, in different parts, where in Germany were there people of other nationalities that would come in. And certainly that would be the case, yes. Uh, even in recent years, lots and lots, but even in the past, you had the whole issue of the Turks going back and forth with the Austro-Hungarians, and they always worried about the Ottoman Empire and the Turks coming in. As I said, you had the French coming in and going back and forth. So yeah, you will find populations of other nationalities in whatever boundary of Germany you want to have. Yes? In the, in the northern area, Northern areas uh, of uh, Prussia, north, the northeast, you, you encounter the winds, the windish people, which were, were displaced, and they show up in, in our in, in your DNA research nowadays. Okay, he's mentioning up in the north, the windish people yes. uh, were displaced, came in, and may have inserted some of their DNA, and now merged with our ancestors. And you may find in your test, you may find that as an ethnicity. 
So to, while to a large extent, people didn't move too much in the old days, there were a number who did. They traveled some great distances. And as I said before, separate even from being in the armies, marching back and forth. And you might find some uh, mixtures that way of DNA. So. Okay, no more questions. Then my next one is how to find your hometown. And for this presentation, it's only about how do you find the hometown. Later on, somewhere down the road, we can talk about once you found the hometown, what do you do with that information and how do you get the records? But the first key is often is where did they come from? And uh, the first thing we want to emphasize is you really want to look at the records here on this side of the ocean as much as you can for any clues because in Germany, they don't really have much in the way of central archives as such. We're accustomed to going, We're accustomed through, to going through and looking at censuses and, and uh, pension files and the like. Uh, they did do censuses in Germany. For a long time, people thought there weren't money, uh, but Roger Miner just recently took a sabbatical, went over for a year, would go into archive and said, you got any censuses? And the archive says, no, we don't have any censuses. Can I go back and look? You know, yeah, I go back and look. And about an hour or two later, it comes out and says, look what I found. So, but in many of the cases, particularly where they just had the names and not the accumulated statistics that got sent up the line, the names stayed in the little city or village where the record keeping was there. So it is very important to the extent you can figure out what hometown your folks came from and also what religion were they. Like I say, in the beginnings, you were either Lutheran or Catholic. It became evangelical, which added in some of what we consider like the Calvinists and like. And then you do get some other uh, religious sects as well. But you really want to look on this side of the pond. Don't assume you can jump across and voila, find your ancestors. Again, emphasize the idea of being a researcher, not a searcher. Pay attention to the record. Uh, who created the record? Why was it created? Was the government giving away money if you registered? Sure, sure, I'm, I'm eligible, right, right? Uh, some of our ancestors may have lied, cheated, stole, or the like. Uh, again, what did the person writing the record hear the person say? And then if it's indexed, what did the indexer try to figure out from the handwriting? Uh, in the case of my Meisters, I find Meister spelled at least 21 different ways. And the only letter in common is the M. In one case, they were Masons. And how do you get Mason from Meissner? You have to think of how did it sound to a foreign ear. Now, where do you look? Uh, again, this is research, I believe it's originally Roger Minor from uh, the Midwest and found really church records are sort of the golden place to find things, particularly if they were attending a German church. And then the priest or minister would know who they were when a child was being baptized and sort of say, hey, parents, where did you come from? So that's sort of an ideal place, one of the places you want to find what church did your ancestors go to here in the United States? So you can look in see directories, maps, what were the closest churches. Again, you can figure out what religion they were. Then you have some of the others, the pensions, county genealogies, the passenger list, probably the more recent years than the older years, naturalization, although often they just say, well, I'm no longer going to be a servant or a subject to the king of Bavaria. Well, Bavaria was a pretty big place. Uh, sometimes marriage licenses and censuses to a little bit. So vital church records, just to show examples of some of these. Uh, I'm from Pittsburgh originally. That's where all my relatives settled. And my Meissners went to uh, a church, St. Philomena, in Pittsburgh. And the diocese there, at least, has a nice archive. For $15 an hour, they'll do the research. And they've now digitized the records. And if they found a record for $5 more, they'll send you the little strip with just your ancestor's name. They won't send the whole page because these are sacramental records. These are not on the Internet. Not everything you need is on the internet. 
So there's their first daughter, Barbara, and they didn't really ask, where'd you come from? Joseph, that's my great grandfather. So oh, we're from Bavaria. Well, thanks. Well, you don't stop with your direct ancestors. You do all the collateral lines. So then there was George. And for there, he said, Busselsheim, Bavaria. Busselsheim? Bus Do they really mean Busselsheim? Now I can see the record and notice the B in Busselsheim is just like the B in Bavaria because German handwriting Bs and Ps to Germans even sound alike. Lamps and lambs is the same thing to them. But know that they wrote a B. And then there is Andreas, and he was also Busselsheim, Bavaria. And finally, there's Rose. And there they said Pusselsheim. This is the only record I have for Rose. She was born in 1862, did not survive to the 1870 census. And the original cemetery, they moved to put Pitt Stadium in its place. So they're gone. But there was my clue by looking at all the kids, records not on the internet in the German church. But about pension applications, uh, that Barbara Meissner, you saw the first daughter married to John Fierce. Uh, he applied for a pension for disability and then she applied for the widow's pension. Again, this is not online. Fold 3 has been doing the Civil War widow's pensions and they really haven't advanced in you know, about two years now. It's sort of on hold. But otherwise, you either have to get somebody to go to the archives, or the more recent ones are in St. Louis, or go yourself. In this case, place of birth, Germany. Well, thanks, Johnny. <laughs> what about draft registrations? Everyone I saw didn't have this, but they had three different cards that they used. Again, learn about the records. And for people born from about middle of 1886 to middle of 1897, it said city, state, country. And here's an example of a Emil Ott, born in Mecklenburg, Germany. I guess Mecklenburg, Germany, but it's a hint. That's what the person wrote, but at least that's a case. So for some of those draft registrations, you will find they used a card that asked that information. The other ones, which of course my ancestors and probably yours, doesn't have that. So, but you have to look everywhere. State death certificates. Here's one for uh, John Fierce filled out. If you look closely at the top, it says this is a copy, and you look at it real closely, all the handwriting is exactly the same. It's a copy. So what do we do? We keep looking and we go get the original. In this case, not only does it say Germany, they had a rubber stamp for Germany. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> thump, 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 thump. They're all German. Now again, you have to be careful with records because this is again Barbara, she's the widow, who when she went to sign her name just made an X. And apparently after her husband died, they said, father's name. She said, Andrew J. They said, mother's name. She said, Barbara Shank. That's Barbara's parents. That's not John's. So again, you have to pay attention to, you know, would they know when he was born? Well, this is not the decedent saying that. So, but you have to be careful. You can't believe everything you read. Passenger arrival list. Uh, my mother's cousin, his grandfather is Wenzel Bear from Bohemia. Remember, Bohemia was the German-speaking part of Czechoslovakia, uh, the Sudetenland. And after 1891, on the passenger list, they did ask, where did you come from and where are you going? And these four guys, Johann, Wenzel, Josef, and Anton, were all from this little village in Bohemia, Czechovitz, and the three on the bottom were all going to Pittsburgh. One on top was going to New York. So when your ancestors migrated, they weren't just saying, I'm going to the United States. They said, we're going to Pittsburgh, because they, they're the reason to push or pull them to Pittsburgh. They knew about it. But here's the case on the more recent passenger list where it will say where they're from. And you go look on a map, and there it is. 
of course, trying to find German records now in Czechoslovakia after World War II, they threw all the Germans out. So some luck with that. What if it's before that? Well, you can start to do little tricks and whatever. Uh, this is my Meissner's coming across, 1846 in New York. I just pulled all the names from the passenger list, put into a spreadsheet, sort of alphabetically, then found them in South Pittsburgh in 1850, found everybody in the enumeration district that was from Germany or didn't say where they were from, sorted them alphabetically and went down the list and can I find anyone besides the Meissners, Bernard, Barbara, and little Andreas, Barbara, and my original Bernard, born in 1846. And no, but it's a way to look. Was there a group of them? Because as we've heard before, maybe you can't find in records of your ancestor, but maybe their neighbors that migrated with them or were witnesses when they applied to become a citizen or something came from the same area and maybe if you look at their records you can figure out where they came from and that's a clue to where to look for your ancestors. Newspapers, obituaries, wills, Peter Gable, one of my favorite Texas Germans, he's one of the first brewers in Houston. All right, brought beer to Houston. He was rich enough that when he died they actually published his will in the Houston Post. But just an example of you can look for wills or newspapers. And in this case, he says, okay, after giving the money to everybody else, then my nephew, Jacob Gable, same surname, in Herxheim, Hamburg, Rhine, Pfalz, Bavaria, Germany. So if we want to say, where do we think Peter came from? That's his nephew, which is the son of his brother. So there's a good place to start looking if we go through. Okay, what about the census? It depends. Standard answer. 1860, they said, don't say Germany, because it really wasn't a Germany as such, say Baden, Bavaria, Hanover, or whatever. 1870, 1880, don't say Germany, say Prussia, Bonn, Württemberg, Essen, Darmstadt, whatever. That's 1860, 1870, 1880. 1900, don't write Prussia or Saxony, write Germany. <laughs> <sighs> but on 1900, they'll ask them, when did you come here? And then you can start looking in passenger lists. For Bohemians or Hungarians, don't say Austria. They'll say Bohemia or Hungary. If a person speaks German, were they born in Germany? Austria, Switzerland, we heard that before this morning. So they would ask them just because they spoke German, don't assume they're from Germany. And the same way if they spoke Polish, were you in born in German Poland? Yeah, it's Poland now, but when you were born, it was part of Germany. Or Austria, or was it part of Russia? So again, you want to learn about the records. Look at how were the enumerators instructed? What were they supposed to put in the form before you go looking in the forms? Look and see what the directions were. Now, I know we guys don't have a gene for asking directions and learning for reading directions, but for genealogists, you really sort of want to do that. And here's some examples. Uh, up at the top, we have uh, by Christina Ott, a great great grandmother, and she's from Baden. We see the Meissners there were from Bavaria, but the top one of that second list is Hesse Darmstadt, and there's a Switzerland on the bottom and two more Badens above them. So it gives you a clue at least to start to narrow down areas. Cemeteries, monuments may sometimes have some. I was recently in a cemetery looking for some of my records, my ancestors. This is not one of them. I know he's not German, but he said, what county did he come from? So, and you can find German ones with that sometimes as well. Uh, here's my great-great-grandfather, Andreas. The tombstone's in German, but it says he was born the 21st of July, 1850. Doesn't say where. At least I got a clue if I find more Andreas Meissners, I'm looking for the one who was born in July, 1850. So it can sort of help me that way. So, when all else fails, one thing you can try are surname maps. The ones they do for Germany are based on current phone books. 
So it's not back in the 1790s or the 1870s or the 1920s. It's sort of now, but it may give you a clue. And I just put in my Andreas Meissner married to Barbara Schenk. And this is mostly Bavaria, does the whole map of Germany. And you can sort of see there's that one little area there in the Unterfranken, the northwest part of Bavaria, where relatively there are a good number of Meissners and there's a whole lot more shanks. The scales are a bit different. And lo and behold, there's my little Puselzheim, now population 175 people. And it would point out if I didn't know it was Puselzheim, at least it would be pointing me into the Unterfranken as a place to start looking for Meissners and shanks. So it's then another thing you can sort of try. So be creative, think outside the block, Look in the American records first. Don't assume you're going to be jumping across to something in Germany or a German speaking area over there. Spelling is optional in genealogy. Like I say, I have 21 different spellings of Meissner that I've found. Think of how it might have sounded or looked. Look at the collateral lines. It was Baby Rose who led me to Busselsheim. That's the only record I have of her. Friends, acquaintances, and neighbors as well. They may have moved as a group or moved to an area and settled in a place where there are more people like them from the same sort of area. So, so when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, could be the truth. Questions, comments? Yes, one here in the room. On your comment about looking in church records, especially as they're German churches, uh, Roman Catholics here in the United States in the 1800s and early 1900s still did their records in Latin. When you're looking at baptism certificates and you have to get them from the churches, look for the words X. Loco, E X L O C O, that means from the place. Right. So she's saying if you're looking at church records, particularly in the case of the Roman Catholic, they had them in Latin. You may find the same case in the records in Germany as well, because that was Charlemagne started that. He wanted the whole empire speaking one language so they can understand the rules and whatever. Uh, we deal more recently, we look back and we see the Fraktur printing. And Hitler hated that and got rid of it. So that's why the more recent records are not in that extra printing that we have to sort of learn. But point out the records are in Latin, so you want to understand the Latin phrases, the key words. You don't need to order a menu meal in Latin. You're just looking for the key records, and you can find lists on the web as well of, and it's, was it X? Ex loco, it's like a location. Where are you from? And then right after that will be the, the city. And again, it may be in Latin. And again, it's how the priest may be spelling it. Uh, and the same way, as I mentioned, when the French came through, some of the records are in French and even use the French calendar. The so. baptism record I found actually identified the birthplace of my father's mother, who had been born in East Prussia but she always said Germany, but it actually was a village in Poland, and that was the only record. Okay, so what she's saying is it was her, her grandmother, uh, born really in East Prussia. We were pointing before East Prussia, not Prussia, now what's now part of Poland. The grandmother always said she was from Germany, but no, it really was East Prussia. Uh, you're also saying the Catholics, for the longest time, because their sacramental records played, held them close to the vest. They're starting to open it up. As I understand now, it's bishop by bishop can decide. So that you will find now uh, records from Cincinnati, New York, Chicago are now being made available online. Uh, find My Past is doing a lot of those. They have also now working with Ancestry, the Irish church records have got those from the beginning up to about 1880 in that case. So there are some cases now where the Catholic records are being put online. Uh, in other cases, you have to look to see, do in fact they have an archive? 
and usually you may have to pay something. And like I say, in some of those cases, you saw those little strips I had for my mice mirrors, and it has ditto marks. And that's great. What's the top of the page? Whether they did or we got to that line, well, we can't show you that. So sometimes I will. So, but the Catholic records are starting to open up a bit more. But again, if you can ask the church itself, they may give you just the record of your ancestor, but you may be able to get that. And I've had some success uh, in a number of other locations. But look, that now some are becoming available online, whole dioceses. How reliable is the American uh, petition for naturalization? How reliable is the petition for naturalization? It was a two-step process. You came to the United States, you declared you wanted to be a citizen, filled out that form. Depending on the time period, you could go to a local court or a federal court. More recently, you have to go to a federal court. And then after three years, you're supposed to come back. You bring a witness who is a citizen with you to say, yes, you're a good upstanding person. You've lived here and you've given up your allegiance to whoever it was in your home country. And then you become a citizen. And in most cases, the experience I've found is, yeah, they were sort of telling the truth. They were in court, which can be an intimidating place for a lot of folks. I've had situations where you're supposed to wait a couple of years before you did your declaration. They sort of got off the boat, walked to the courthouse, and declared. And so you'll have a couple of situations like that. So if you know when they came, start looking from that date. Don't wait three years to start looking at the courts. And the older records could be in a civil court or a federal court. More recently, it has to be the federal court. Now, if they come to this country as a young child, they're going to believe whatever it is that their parents tell them. And if the parents say they came from a, a village in Germany and they did not, the child is going to still think that they came from that village. Right. He's pointing out, first of all, you had to be an adult and it usually was adult male that applied to be naturalized, and then your whole family, your wife and kids, automatically are naturalized as well. But he's pointing out, if you come as a child, uh, that uh, the case I had my John Fierce, he was three years old when he came to this country. So the family said where they were from, and that's all he knows. So you always have to take things with a grain of salt. How do they know the information? You know, and did they have a reason to misrepresent the information? Or they just plain didn't know? They didn't know how to spell the name, they didn't, their own name. They didn't know how old they were. You didn't celebrate birthdays and have birthday parties. You have to consider what were the customs and norms of where they came from and what is the history. You have to understand what's the story behind the record. In this case, the petition of uh, naturalization did not happen for 50 years after they immigrated in the United States. So by that time, this particular person was in his 60s, and he filled out a petition for naturalization, but he came as a child. And I am thinking that he believed what his mother told him to be true, and I don't know if it is true. Right, because they say in this case, the individual came as a child. Apparently, his parents did not become naturalized, which would have automatically made him a citizen. So then about 50 years later, 50, 60 years later, he's an older man. Let's I think how old I am now. It's not that old, uh, 50s or 60s. And now he's going to apply a citizenship, and they're going to say, where'd you come from? And I was three years old. I don't remember. But... Here's what mom told me, so this is what I'll say, best I could tell. So it's up to us as the genealogist to sort of see if we can figure out, is that true? Okay. <laughs> this is a question. Um, in the Republic of Texas, and you see this, uh, did people automatically become American citizens when Texas became uh, a state in the U.S.? Okay, so we had the Germans that came often in large groups into Texas and the various settlements, and Texas then separated from Mexico and became its own republic. So then everybody is a member of the republic, and then it became a state. So what happens to all the people who are citizens of the Republic of Texas? 
Well, once they became a state, magic wand waved, they were all now citizens of the United States and brought with them then all the arguments from Mexico and we had to go to war for Mexico because we brought the Texans in. So that was part of the debate with that. And it was the same thing. You again learn all the history. They came in as a slave state. So then you had to look for trading off. You have a free state as well to keep things balanced. You have to learn about the history. But yeah, they would not have to apply to become citizens of the United States if they were already citizens of the Republic of Texas. And I'm not aware of anything you had to do to become a citizen of the Republic of Texas. They were eager for folks to come, so they were given land away. And it's sort of when you got here is how much land you got. And if you got here before the war with Mexico, you got more land because you had your life on the line. So but in, in that case, yeah, you would not look for a naturalization record for people who had been already living in Texas when it became a state. Good question. Okay, let me turn this back to Ann then. Again, if you have other questions, success stories of how you found hometowns are like, please use our Facebook page in between the meetings and like, share that with them. And if you have questions, post them there as well. So I'm gonna put down a couple slides here. Okay. okay. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about translations. Um, first of all, there's a handout, and sorry, here we go. Um, there's a handout, and all the websites that I'm going to talk about are on the handout, so you don't need to worry about copying things down. Uh, one of the things I wanted to to point out is that I know Bernard talked a little bit about um, his DNA. I had 15 out of 16 great great grandparents that were born in what is today Germany. So I've been doing German research for a little while. <laughs> when I first started, it was like hitting a German immediately, basically. And um, so I had to learn a little bit about translations pretty quickly. I'm shorter. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give you some of the current things that I've learned about translations. Now, some of you don't like Facebook, some of you do, okay? And we've already heard about some of the Facebook pages that do translations. Um, I monitor a few of the, of the different ones, and I found that that you know, German genealogy is a pretty good one for translations, as well as German genealogy translations. <laughs> and then again, there's the area ones, like the bottom one here, I have German impression genealogy, but we mentioned some other ones as well that do translations for those specific areas of Germany. And they do have people from Germany on on those uh, on those Facebook pages. And you upload an image, and they try to help you translate it. Okay, that was easy, right? You already knew about that. So FamilySearch.org um, helps you with translations as well. I'm not sure if you knew about this, but if you go to the wiki, um, which is um, hopefully you're very familiar with the wiki, and you you uh, look for genealogy research groups. I think in your handout you have the web page to this. And uh, the first item after the search is going to come up with the genealogy uh, research groups. And you're going to come up with a list. And in that list is alphabetical, ABC, whatever. So we're going to click on G for Germany. So when we click on G, we find out that there's Germany slash Prussia. And what they have is a family search community for German genealogy research. And you can um, click on this and you can join that group and you can monitor the questions. You can monitor um, what they're doing on that as well. Okay. When you, they also have a Facebook group, but their Facebook group is a little more all of, you know, more all of Central Europe. So it's not as focused as some of the other Facebook groups are. Uh, so I don't tend to look at that as much. So once I join this group, um, it's sort of like joining a Facebook group. You have to join it. And I think, I don't know if they ask you questions or not. So I join this group. And what you see is similar to Facebook in that you can upload an image or you can point them to something on familysearch.org. You can point them to something on Ancestry. And it, this is answered by the librarians in Salt Lake City. The German librarians in Salt Lake City are answering the questions. 
So that's what makes this a little bit different is that you're actually getting the help from Salt Lake City. <laughs> and you don't have to go there. Okay. So you can ask other questions, you know, related to other countries as well. As you can see, I just collected Germany because that's what we're talking about today. But this group also helps with other things as well. And you could, you know, ask them, hey, do you have records on this or whatever? I can't find this or I have a question. And they will help you a lot. Okay. Now the next one I've also used is German Heritage in Letters. I don't know if you've heard about this one. Um, this is uh, basically www.germanletters.org. This is a website um, that is managed by the German Historical Institute of Washington, DC. And their charter is to collect letters that were sent from Germany to the US or from the US to Germany between 1850 and, 18, and 1920. That's the period of time they're focusing on for this research. Now they've also, they've already gotten, you know, like major archives, but they're looking for individuals who have records and, you know, different other places that they don't have the records from. So they put this website together and you can search the website for various right? things. For various things. I so actually, I actually, because, um, because I have a few Germans, inherited some German, German letters and I had some that fit into this category. So um, I selected my surname and I had two letters that I was able to submit from, from 1907 that they put on the website. So what I did is I, I scanned in the pages of the letters and actually I think I had the envelopes as well because they want to know who it's to and who it's from because they have to want to place the town, you know, at either end. <clears throat> and so um, I submitted these letters. They're all just handwritten letters. And what they did, I, mean, I clicked on the one to the left. So you can, oops, go back. Sorry. They would take the letter and they would type it in German and then they would translate it to English and they did this in like two days. So it was very fast because very cool. Very I don't know, you know, if they why, but they just did about two days. So it was great. Now what you can do is if you don't have letters, you can still search for your surnames in there to see if somebody submitted letters. And it may not be your family, maybe your family, it's it's you know, whatever. But it's something that's a little bit different that you may not have heard about before. And they do free translations <laughs> if you have letters in that time period. Is it only up to 1920? Is that um, for privacy reasons? Um, I would guess so. I'm sorry. Was it not up to 1920 for privacy reasons? And I would suspect that was the case um, because those people are obviously not with us. But yeah. Because I have a whole slew from like the 1940s. Yeah, she has a whole slew from 1940s, and, and I have I have records in 1938 I couldn't submit, and you know, yeah. So unfortunately, we have a question from the audience. We do. From the sorry, from the chat. I'm gonna try to use my mic so they can. Okay, kill it. <laughs> that isn't gonna work. That didn't work. Okay, so uh, we'll get that worked out later. But the question from the audience is, can you search by region? Um, I don't remember. I'm sorry. I have to go look in the letter. I don't think you can. I think it's by name. Oh, I'm sorry. The, you, the question was, can you search by region? And I don't think you can. Have another question, my family? I was just wondering uh, about the German, old German Gothic script. Mm -hmm. How recently did they change from that to what they do now? I don't have the dates on that. Um, the date was when did they change from the Gothic printed script? Printed or the written? It was a, it was a printed Fraktur. That was the one Hitler got rid of. So that's 1940. Okay. The current shrift, the handwriting she showed in her letters, you may have to need to repeat this. Uh, I'm not sure exactly when that went away. Maybe that was one thing, a good thing about Hitler. <laughs> So I don't know if the um, audience could um, on, online could hear, but we were, we were ask, he was asking when the older script went away, and it was about um, the time of Hitler. Printing. Printing, Printing. yeah. Printed script. Okay. All right. I have one question. Sure. I have letters from the early 1900s that my relatives were not very educated. And so there's a lot of question marks as to what the letters were actually saying because of the way they spelled words. Mm -hmm. Will they take a guess at that? Sure. Or will they just say, impossible? Because the person I took them to said it's impossible. 
So you can try because, um, so the question, I always keep forgetting, sorry, thank you. The, the question was, she has a lot of letters, but the handwriting is in, and spelling, et cetera, is quite questionable. And I would try, as long as you know who the to and the from is and what towns they went to, that's what they're looking for. And they, they may try and be able to do it. It's, it's try, definitely try. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Now, obviously you can do it yourself. <laughs> it's a little harder. Um, I've had to work at this a little bit. <laughs> uh, the first book, um, if I can, you can decipher German records. I have to own this book. I know it's upstairs in the library uh, on the eighth floor. And there's another more recent one. I think that's a the second one's a 2018, so it's a fairly new book. And then always it's helpful to have um, Ernest Stoltz uh, German English genealogy dictionary as a handy book too to look at. Now there may be some other books that are helpful for translations, but these are kind of the ones that were most popular. Okay. All right. Um, you can take online classes, and um, there's several. And these are just examples of online classes that you can take. I'm not going to go through these. Um, they all turn green, which is not good. I had them all black, but they all turn green, unfortunately. Uh, so they're hard to read, but at least they're on your handout, so that kind of helps. Okay. Now I'm going to talk a minute about the um, websites for translating words or phrases. So there's some new ones on here that you may or may not use. Leo and, and Lingui, I think that's how you pronounce it, the top two. When we went to the conference in um, in Sacramento, California this year, the German genealogy conference, they were promoting the top two, Leo and Lingui, stating that they did better translations than Google. And that's very possible because when I do a Google translation, I have to take it back and forth and back and forth to get it to say what I want to say. And it takes like three tries at least to get it right. But these top two do a little better translations. And so they're worth considering. And there's um, right under Lingui, it says um, DE. EPL.com, and that's a Google type uh, format, but it uses Lingui for the translation. So it's it's a pretty good way of translating. So I would use those instead of Google Translate to get a little more accuracy in your German. Um, another one, WordMine, this is an interesting one. And let's say that you have some German that you're trying to look at, and you could see the first couple letters and the last couple letters, and in between there's a bunch of humps. It could be M's, it could be N's, it can be U's, right? Those people know what I'm talking about, they're laughing. You don't know what it is. And so what you can do is you can put the first and last letters in, and WordMind will give you all the possible words that it could be. So it's very handy, yeah. So try that when you get stuck in those M's and N's and U's and such, okay? Uh, and then again, there's lots of dictionaries online that you can use. I just listed a couple here. Okay. All right. On WordMind, does that, do they use that for ger just German, or is there a WordMind for like Norwegian and other things? Do you know? I don't remember. I'm sorry. Uh, the right. question was, <laughs> I saw his hand go up. <laughs> Can you use it for um, Norwegian or other languages? And I'm not sure. Okay. Just check it out. Thank you for that hand. <laughs> just raise it. I know what you're talking about. Uh, okay. Um, German Script Help. There's uh, several different websites you can use. Uh, these are just, again, examples of websites that different uh, people have used. I've, I've taken several webinars and, and gone to a lot of sessions, and these are some of the more popular ones that people have used to um, play with different words and different scripts. You can put your surname in, see what it looks like in different scripts and things like that. So it's kind of helpful. And yes, that's one of my ancestors from 1699 on archean.de, and it was hard to read. <laughs> Once you get back to the early 1700s, it's really it's getting tough up back there. Um, so anyway, learning how to uh, getting help on those scripts and, and what individual words looks like can be very helpful. All right, uh, translation tips. So the second one, is uh, 19 abbreviations. So for example, if you see a D dot, it doesn't mean died, it means the, okay? So there's, this, these are just little helpful acronyms that are in some of the German church records for you. 
There's about 19 of them, so it's a kind of small list. The second from the bottom is German illnesses and death terms and translations. So that's another good one to take a look at because those are often hard to read. And then the bottom one is German professions. So there's 70 pages of professions on that website, so be careful, don't print it. <laughs> or if you do, just know it's gonna be 70 pages long. Um, so it has a lot of terms on it. So you know how, just like, I don't know how many terms for farmer, right? Okay, and different regions have different terms for farmer. So this would help you a lot you know, if you're looking for trying to understand what something is, okay? Now, um, there are apps. I don't um, use my phone as much for translations. I have played with the Google app a little bit, and this was uh, kind of interesting. It, it advertises that it can translate on the fly, right? So I took, I had a picture from a German side of a German church with, you know, a bunch of history of the church, whatever, you know, plaque. So I took my camera and uh, went to the Google Translate app, went to the camera mode, and held my, my phone over this picture, and it translated what was written on that German wall, but there was no way to save the translation. It's like, oh. <laughs> and it's kind of meant to help you with your traveling so that you, you, know, you don't know what the sign says, you hold your phone up and it tells you what it says in English. So could you not do a screenshot? <laughs> well, you're, you're in the Google app, so trying to get out of the Google app to do a screenshot on your phone is, I don't think you can. You don't have to get out of the yeah. screen camera. Well, I don't know, I'm sure. Anyway, you can try it and tell me how to do it. That'd be great. Because <laughs> that was uh, tricky. So I, I haven't played with these other ones, but these are the most popular ones for travel and translating um, apps. All right. Then we have hire and pay somebody, which uh, Bernard has done recently because the records are not available, which is one reason to do it. You can also, if you have letters, like we have bunches of letters, uh, you can hire somebody like a local student or teacher. My daughter took German, and would she translate them for me? No, she's too busy. Um, then we have uh, professional genealogy translators, which will cost you a little bit more, obviously. And you can take an online class, and those you have to, some of them you have to pay for. There's some classes that you have to pay for. But I forgot one very important one. What do you think I forgot? <laughs> Our little group right here. Exactly. Mr. Ed back there in the back row. <laughs> Mr. Ed is the German librarian here on the eighth floor. <laughs> and he knows German. <laughs> and you can make an appointment for a one-on-one -on -one session with Ed. So if you have something you're stuck on or need to work on, you can go up to the eighth floor and he will help you. Okay. Ask so, Maureen. Ask Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, definitely, we have a local resource um, on the eighth floor here in the library. Um, he's going to be doing our tour after this as well. So he's going to go up and um, gather everybody up and take you through the German records and give us a little bit of tour when we get done. So that's exciting too. So we can't forget about him. Okay. All right, is there any questions on the translations that we haven't already addressed? Okay. All right, so our next meeting. Our next meeting is January 18th, 10.30 to 12, here in this room and on Zoom. We're gonna talk about the various um, migration waves, kind of general beginner kind of, you know, a little bit of stuff, and a little bit advanced in there. And then this thing called Find My Germans. We've well, heard of Who Do You Think You Are, right? Yeah. Well, this is our version of Who Do You Think You Are. <laughs> so Find My Germans. So what we're hoping to do is we can get group conversations going. So what we're looking for is if you have a brick wall, um, if you need some help with something particular, and um, we want to share it with the group or we want the group discussion around it. So you can use our Facebook page, you can use our email, um, or if you have um, some topic, like for example, you know, want to know more about archaeon.de, matricula, or um, genealogy.net, or one of the other German websites, you know, let us know. We can try to use, you know, this 
part of the meeting to kind of discuss that as a group or walk through it or whatever. Yep. Are you going to be talking about Germans who came into Canada and also into Mexico? Um, we're going to talk about Canada and Mexico. I, I don't know that we were planning on that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, he added then after they came to Mexico or German or Canada, then came to the US. We sort of framed, if you saw at the beginning, it was Germans, again, the broad definition of Germans, who came to the United States in the 17, 18, 19 hundreds. So that's sort of what we started as sort of our our mission statement, if you will. So you're not going to be uh, so, saying anything about Canadian? If you have a specific thing, we can try to address. If you have a specific person that came via Canada, uh, depending on where they sailed from, it was cheaper to sail to Canada than even New York, depending on where you were leaving in Europe. So we'll, we'll certainly we'll consider that. And again, encourage folks, use the Facebook. I used to put up your questions, put up your success stories or whatever. Uh, because something that you learned or found will be benefit to the rest of us. We're all still semi-novices at this. I've got one set of great-great-grandparents I've got back across. The other ones, I'm still scratching my head trying to figure out where they came from, why they came. I know where they ended up, but how did they get there? So, so we have another question. Uh, as far as to uh, Canada, I have found my own experience that many well, those people came through this country, they parted in Baltimore as such, took the train across the Midwest, and eventually ended up in Canada when they opened up the ferries after 1904. Uh, the particular family I'm thinking of, 10 kids, three kids are born in Germany, uh, all except the last child was born in the States, and the one person who was related to me was born in Canada. I thought it was a Canadian family before I researched it. Uh, okay, so to kind of summarize what he said, they came into Baltimore, I believe, and they went across to the Midwest, and then they went up north into Canada, and one of the kids was born actually in Canada. Yeah, so that, that definitely happens. Okay. Yep, another question? Do you have any information about uh, the pre, uh, well, the early 1700s? Uh, they stopped at Rotterdam, and uh, I don't know whether they they actually went to Southern England in order to get they had to get a permission in order to go to Pennsylvania Colony or wherever they were going. Okay, he's asking about immigrants that may have come in like the 1700s, in particular, got to Rotterdam. Often, often they only had enough money to get to Rotterdam, and then they either had to get more money or indenture themselves to pay the passage. There were some cases of folks that ended up uh, in England, and then there were so many of them, and the English decided, well, you know, what we're going to do with all these. We have these colonies over here. Hey, you've got the colonies. That's some good places to go. Uh, and to a large extent, sort of what they call the, sometimes the first wave, in the 1700s, they'll use the generic term the Palatines, although they didn't all come from the Palatine. And uh, but there's a number of folks. The one that always comes to mind I've heard is Hank Jones. And I have in the reference sheet that I have that's on the web for you folks uh, that are out there in the in the cloud, a number of books that folks have documented a lot of them terms of where they came from, where they settled. A number of them were up in upstate New York, for example. And there's an old Jimmy Stewart black and white movie about in Revolutionary War times, them, them marching up to in the French Indian War sorts of things. And it turns out they were all from Germany that came across. So the records, like I say, a lot of them have been thoroughly researched. There's not as many as who came in the 1800s, but they've been here longer. So they have more descendants that way. They've had more new generations. So a lot of that has been pretty thoroughly researched in most cases in books, although I'm sure there's stuff on the, the web as well. And like I say, you can find a list probably about four or five of the books uh, in the handout that I prepared for today. Anybody else? 
Yep. Um, when you're talking about translation, this isn't a question, it's just a statement. There is a lady who lives in Fairview who will translate at cost um, pages of information like the letters, but it would be personal and private. So I have her um, email if anyone is interested. She's okay. a lovely lady and doesn't mind. So there's a, a woman in Frisco that will do trans Fairview, I'm sorry, Fairview, that will do translations at cost, um, but it'll be a little private and, and uh, we can get you the email if you, if you want. Okay. So um, if you could give us that email, that'd be great. All right. Can I get back to the PowerPoint or not? We kind of lost the PowerPoint here. <laughs> Okay. Okay, there we go. I just really needed it for one more slide. <laughs> so um there you go. It's down. It's not paging down. I'm trying to go to the next slide. Not to go. Mm -hmm. um, okay, it's actually we need to go down the slide. It's just not going. I'll just escape my presentation mode. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. And then the last slide. There we go. We're not sharing. Not sure. there. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to think. No. I see it. No. It's coming. Ain't technology great? Yeah. So next time, don't take the slides away. <laughs> <laughs> there we okay. Okay. Got All right. Time. So that kind of concludes the things we had today. But we also want to encourage you to participate on Facebook and email. And, and if you want to volunteer to help, to speak, to translate, anything, please let us know. Okay? Or run technology. Or <laughs> run technology. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've had a lot of fun with that today. So thank you very much.